we have one final speaker that I have to introduce, uh, Jeffrey Kripal. And this is actually part of the trajectory that uh, you saw at the end of Nafisa's presentation. He was just bringing us there a moment about a new worldview, new values that are objective values. Uh, and this is a critical matter of an intervention in our entire culture. And of course, we are an, we are an educated and educational culture. And the penetration of the academy, the place where we teach our children and where we share our knowledge and come to consensus, colleges, universities, all down to the high schools, is the critical transition point that we, we need to engage now. One of the most creative figures in that engagement is Dr. Jeffrey Kripal, who's not appearing here live, but who recorded a short talk with me just the other day. Jeffrey Kripal, as the professor of uh, religion, uh, and philosophy at the uh, an Associate Dean of Humanities at Rice University, one of America's great universities. He's the co-founder of their uh, GEM program, Gnosticism, Esotericism, and Mysticism, the first doctoral program of its kind in the country, and also one of the largest in the world of such programs. He's also a public intellectual who's very active with the Esalon organization, and in his 11 books, he's covered everything from the human potential movement to UFOs and culture to comic books, finding the sacred thread that is being buried throughout our culture that he's looking to help emerge as so many of other speakers. So I engaged him about this matter of our culture and politics and religion. And that also Jeffrey's recorded talk will be our final moment here. I will come on thereafter and just say a word before letting everybody go to break. So Jeffrey Kripal. Thank you, Bill, for having me. Um, you know, when I present my ideas abstractly, people often look at me like I have three heads. Um, but when I explain those same ideas in the context of my biography, um, they make a lot of sense to people. And even if they don't agree with these ideas, they at least are, are understandable. So that's what I wanted to do today for the next few minutes. Um, I wanna move through four different ideas. Um, religious exclusivism, religious inclusivism, religious pluralism, and what I call secret humanism, which is where I want to end up. Um, the, the idea here, you'll see, you'll see the ideas play out, but it's very much about what I call the flip, which is this notion of, of leaving one's own thought and one's own culture, one's own birth beliefs, one's own birth ideas, and looking back at them from outside, as it were, and realizing that human beings are human beings uh, first, and then their religious or cultural identities and beliefs are built on top of that human foundation. Um, and I'll explain why that's such a rare, that's such a rare thing today. But I think it is becoming increasingly less rare and and more pressing. So I grew up in um, the American Midwest, right in the middle of the U.S. Uh, in the state of Nebraska. I grew up in an agricultural community, um, mostly Germans of German descent, um, about a third Catholic, a third Lutheran, and a third everything else Protestant, um, all white, um, very homogenous. Um, my grandmother's and grandfather's generation um, Catholics could not marry Lutherans or vice versa. And if they did, all hell broke loose, as we used to say in Nebraska. Um, by my parents' generation, that was less of a problem. And by my own generation, it was not a problem at all. Um, religious identity, um, particularly being Catholic or Lutheran, didn't, didn't seem to matter. And it matters even less today. So you do see a kind of generational shift or, or movement over the years, but it's still all white. It's still all a uh, German in that, in that context. Um, after high school, I went to a Catholic seminary. I actually wanted to be a monk. And it was there that I was introduced to this new idea called inclusivism. Uh, and I learned that the Catholic church in particular um, was once an exclusivistic tradition as many religious traditions still are. Exclusivism is a very simple kind of religious logic. It works from the principle that excludes other people and other beliefs based on one's own religious beliefs. 
Uh, and this was enshrined in Catholicism through a Latin phrase, extra ecclesiam nulla salus. So outside the church, there is no salvation, which was what my parents and my grandparents grew up with. There was a series of meetings in, in Rome in the 1960s called Vatican II that, that essentially reversed that or rejected that exclusivism and opted for what we call inclusivism, which is essentially a religious way of including other religious worldviews, but still based on one's own beliefs and principles. And so here, a tradition like Catholicism would say that there is salvation in Islam, in Judaism, in Hinduism, and Buddhism, but it's through the light of Christ. These are essentially unconscious Christians, and the people are still saved through classical inclusivism. And it's by no means restricted to, to Christianity. Buddhists, for example, do it all the time as well. Uh, you know, you're not a, a Buddhist in this life, but if you live a good life, You'll, you'll, you'll be a Buddhist in your next life. That's inclusivism. Uh, you're, you're judging and, and ordering, comparing based on your own Buddhist principles. That seemed a bit, that was, a, that was, a, that was a, uh, an advance for sure from the earlier exclusivism, but it seemed a little too convenient uh, to me, at least my 21 or 22 year old self. Um, and so I went to graduate school to study something called the history of religions or, or comparative religion. And I was there introduced to something called pluralism. Pluralism is this idea that actually no tradition, no religious tradition has the full truth. The full truth exhausts or, or overflows all cultural and religious traditions. And every religion is essentially a cultural approximation of some singular um, uh, unsub, unexpressible truth. That worked, um, that worked for a while. Um, then I eventually uh, got to California actually um, and began to study the California counterculture. Uh, I began to study something called the human potential movement, which morphed into what we think of as the new age, which in turn morphed into what we today think of as the spiritual but not religious or, or today the nuns, the, the people who do not or refuse to affiliate at all with any religious tradition. I think today um, I would no longer call myself a pluralist. Um, and the reason is it's too clunky. It, it, it imagines itself as somehow possessing the truth. And all of these religions are essentially different ways to get to this singular truth. So the, the image we're often given is that the religions are different pathways up the same mountain. I just don't believe that anymore. I, I think culture and religious practice and, and spiritual practice are really, really important. And that we're essentially marching up different mountains. Um, these different religious traditions, the different spiritual traditions are all different mountains and people are walking up them um, differently. And you get different things depending on what you believe and what you practice. What I do think, though, is that all of these mountains can come out of the same earth, as it were. Um, I think the gods are us. I think belief, particularly religious belief, is a kind of projection, and that there's a kind of secret human or secret humanism behind all of these, these religious practices and religious experiences. And that's, that's kind of where I am today. Um, the way I think about religious pluralism, which I think is the topic of, of my talk, is I think about it through the metaphor, of, not of the mountains, but of a, of a chessboard. And I think when most people think of religion, they're essentially on the chessboard. And there's white pieces against black pieces or black pieces against white pieces. So if you're a Christian, you have to be somehow against the Hindu pieces or the Buddhist pieces or the Muslim or the Jewish pieces or vice versa. So there's always, there's always contest. There's always conflict because you're identifying with the pieces on, on the chessboard. I think if you study these things long enough and you, you live long enough, at some point you have to ask the question, why do we have to do that? What, why do we have to keep playing that game? And it's really a game. Why do we have to identify 
at all as Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist or, or whatever it is we, we identify as, you begin to realize that religious identity is itself the problem. Um, and the solution, which is no, by no means easy and by no means clear, is to see this deeper kind of secret humanism that runs through all these traditions and is in fact their base. You essentially learn to stand up from the chessboard and to stop playing the game and to essentially see, see the game as a game. Um, and it's this, it's, this, it's this decision or this, this form of reflexivity, as we call it in the academy, that I call the flip. Um, and I think it, it will have to be crucial to any new paradigm, to any new future civilization. Um, because I think the challenge is how do we affirm people's religious identities and religious practices without absolutizing them or without pretending that they're the answer to everything a human being can ask or be. Um, and we know certainly from the last 20 or 30 years that authoritarian regimes, demagogues have aligned themselves very closely with exclusivistic forms of religion. Christianity in the U.S. During, during the Trump years, a kind of Hindutva fundamentalism in India with Narendra Modi to this day. Um, really all over the world, you see a kind of upsurge of what we, what we now call fundamentalism. Um, that word, by the way, is fairly new. Um, it was really just coming into the academic lexicon in the 1980s was when I was in graduate school. But today it's widely used to kind of name not religion per se, but a particular kind of religion that excludes others, that interprets its own texts or revelations in a very literal fashion, and tends to see the past or the religious past as a kind of golden age. Um, and I think what defines our present moment is a kind of turning around, not to deny the past, not to deny those revelations and those experiences of our ancestors, but to turn to the future and essentially say, there's greater truth in the future than there was in the past. The truth lies in the future. It does not lie in the past. Um, and I think that, that fundamental shift, um, which is very hard, by the way, for people to make, is where we want to go religiously now when we think of a new paradigm or a new future culture. And I don't think, by the way, you can think of a new culture or a new civilization without taking the spiritual um, and the religious into serious, serious consideration. I don't, I don't think they're separable. I think human beings are naturally spiritual uh, and they're culturally or socially religious. And you have to figure out how to engage that in a positive and creative way and not just in a negative kind of naysaying way. So I'll end there. I'll end there, Bill. That's, prob that's probably enough. I, I think that I thought today's session was just a brilliant mosaic uh, to set up the rest of what we're going to move on to. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed, uh, Dr. Teplin, and Dr. Kripal uh, for all their talks and, their, and for their conversation with one another.